Our Burroughs. He has been commissioned by the committee to present a comprehensive and modern point of view of the experimental facts about uh, magnetosphere ionosphere coupling, including all of their gory details. It's a topic which is extremely difficult. There's a very broad range of topics to be covered. Those of you who have questions and contributions to make, I'm keeping track of those people who would like to have things to say. But as you f see the discussion coming into an area in which you would like to contribute, raise your hand and come to the front of the stage to discuss the one or two slides that you would like to present. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Burroughs. Well, as Peter said, the uh, subject of the talk this morning is the coupling, magnetospheric ionospheric coupling. Uh, in the. Move it down to about here. It's getting a bit strong. In the steady state from the uh, observational uh, viewpoint. Now, uh, if the steady state magnetosphere doesn't exist, there will be no observations. Uh, one could still discuss it as a theory, but uh, it would make my talk rather short. So I, I will try and assume that there is a steady state magnetosphere uh, approximated uh, for the purposes of observations. Uh, and the coupling then between the magnetosphere and the ionosphere uh, is primarily by uh, various types of energy input to the ionosphere. That is that uh, the ionosphere acts as a load, if you like, in an electrical <coughs> circuit. Uh, there may be uh, less understood ways in which the ionosphere couples back into the magnetosphere. Uh, and there have been a lot of new and exciting observations uh, coming forth in the last uh, few years. Uh, new types of uh, observation techniques. And they have, I think, perhaps at this point been adding to uh, confusion. I'm trying to uh, pr communicate the excitement and uh, filter out the confusion. But um, if we look first at the... Uh, could you turn it on, please? Uh, first slide. Um, I've reproduced here a three-dimensional sketch of the magnetosphere which attempts to uh, show some of the regions which uh, by coupling down the field lines may uh, reach the ionosphere. And uh, I should say in the steady state I'm assuming that uh, the corotational electric field caused by the Earth uh, is, uh, generates the polarization charges which uh, set the plasma within the plasma uh, sphere in motion uh, and that essentially then this uh, region within the plasma pause is, is not part of the steady state uh, magnetospheric problem to be discussed. Uh, that is that you build up the polarization charges uh, at the alphane layer to shield out uh, the external field from the inner magnetosphere. And of course that eliminates most of the magnetosphere below about 60 degrees latitude and, and doesn't leave perhaps too much of the ionosphere <laughs> physicist. But um, <clears throat> in terms of the magnetosphere, that does represent a fairly small uh, volume here. And uh, the much larger volume then is the, uh, is the outer magnetosphere which maps into the auroral oval and the polar cap. Now, one thing which is not shown on this, uh, which has come forward observationally, is that there is a uh, mantle layer, as Heos calls it, or an extension of the boundary layer, all the way around the outer periphery of the magnetosphere, which uh, then means that you have plasma through the plasma sheet around the boundary layer uh, and uh, the mantle, if you like, and that it extends uh, back from the cleft. So it, it uh, covers the tail, uh, clothes the tail, if you like. But um, the, uh, if the ionosphere is a load, uh, and the ionospheric physicist says, uh, we've told you where the load is, more or less. Uh, there's electrical currents flowing in there, which are Peterson currents with E dot J uh, dissipation. Uh, 
Uh, there is particles causing ionization. Now you tell us where the, uh, the generator is uh, to the magnetospheric physicist. And uh, the magnetos, well, it's a little bit like the Arab in the tent, that you have uh, rather a small Arab boy uh, and a very large uh, camel. Uh, and the, uh, the camel uh, represents the whole outer magnetosphere. And uh, so when you ask that sort of question, you're kind of inviting the camel uh, into the tent. And, and this may not be a good arrangement, but it's the purpose of the meeting. Uh, but <laughs> the, um, I think the, the point that one should realize, though, is that uh, the camel uh, has a brother. And that is the magnetosheath, the whole uh, region out to the bow shock. And uh, unfortunately, we're probably going to have to invite that into the tent as well. Uh, and so the ionospheric physicist may find himself crammed between two camels. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> the reason I say this is that uh, if there are currents coming down into the ionosphere uh, and causing the Peterson uh, E dot J dissipation, uh, and if these are coming from a generator somewhere out in the magnetosphere or the magnetosheath, the reasonable place to terminate the problem is where the interplanetary uh, plasma and the uh, solar wind has as yet no knowledge of the magnetosphere and the ionosphere, and that is beyond the bow shot. So um, if we're looking for a generator region, it has to be a place where E dot J is negative. Uh, otherwise, it's a dissipation, uh, an additional dissipation region. And uh, certainly, the chapman Ferrara currents that flow around the day side here, if anything, will tend to be a dissipative region. And uh, this is because of the next slide, where we come down to the ionosphere and look at a summary of Hepner's measurements from OGO-6. The same sort of pattern <coughs> is found in engine uh, observations with some modifications, but the, uh, the basic point is that if this is the polar cap here, then the, and noon is at the top, then the field is directed from dawn to dusk, essentially at uh, all times that it's been observed to date, across the polar cap. And uh, it then is directed uh, equatorward on the morning side oval and poleward on the evening side oval. And it is the currents that then flow down and flow up through this region here, uh, parallel to E, that give you your E dot J dissipation. And uh, there are a number of observations of these uh, coming out now. Well, just going back then for a moment to the uh, magnetosphere, one asks, how far does this really extend, this uh, camel? Uh, and you may think this is a ski pole, you may think it's a pointer, but really, this much of it is the magnetotail, and the Earth is somewhere up there. <laughs> In other words, uh, if you take the magnetotail to have a diameter of 30 or 40 Earth radii, Stern has done a calculation which suggests it may be about 600 Earth radii long. And this is uh, done from an argument of flux conservation if the polar cap field lines map back into the interplanetary or the magnetosheath region, then you uh, have such a, um, a requirement for flux conservation. And uh, if you only generate of the order of 40 or 50 kV across the polar cap, as uh, observations by uh, Hepner and Ingen uh, suggest uh, on the average and many other ground-based observations uh, support, then you uh, have, in order to uh, satisfy your uh, E plus 1 over C uh, V cross B equal to zero condition, you have to uh, have a, uh, and, and the potential that uh, one gets across the polar cap is uh, say about 50 kV, then you, you uh, have to uh, have a tail that's of that order of, of length. Yeah. It's like, so the history is straight a little bit. Like, it's the, it's that. 
Yeah, I'd like to point out that actually the length of the tail was estimated at 10 years before its term by Dungey in 1965. The answer about 1,000 radii. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I haven't necessarily made all of my references uh, correct in this talk. I'm trying to convey the concepts, and, uh, and you're quite right. Thank you. Good um, Well. There, there are some observational uh, observations w which s suggest that this is indeed uh, the case, and um, some of these are, are based on the uh, entry of solar particles into the tail. Uh, if one sees discontinuities in the solar particles, that uh, this is solar flare protons and electrons, which uh, can be treated perhaps as single trajectory particles uh, within a fixed uh, configuration of the, uh, of the magnetosphere. Well, then uh, the work just recently reported by uh, uh, Van Allen's group at Iowa and previous work along the same lines uh, has tried to say there's a discontinuity occasionally in these particle fluxes. If one plots it against time, well, let's look for the increases uh, in fluxes. And this is what happens as seen by a satellite in the planetary medium. Well, now, if you uh, go into the magnetotail here and uh, then observe at low altitudes here the profile that one sees of these particles uh, as a function of time, you uh, find that this discontinuity is preserved with most of its shape. Uh, most of its sharpness within the magnetospheric observation point, uh, and, but it is delayed some dis, uh, point in time, which if you calculate the convection velocity of the field lines, it comes out to be of the order of anything from 60 up to 800 Earth radii, depending on where you are in the tail. So um, there, there's your camel. Now, um, so, if you are looking for Chapman Farrar currents as a. Um, probably not. No. Uh, so, so, if you are looking for uh, Chapman Farrar uh, currents uh, as, a, uh, as a load rather than the source, then uh, you, you have to um, look elsewhere. And I think the circuit may close back at the at the bow shot, but I would like to emphasize that there is not much known about the magnetosheath in terms of both the magnetic field and the plasma parameters. Uh, not enough known, I think, anyway. Uh, and so uh, if, if the ionospheric physicist thinks the magnetospheric physicist is going to enlighten him, uh, it ain't so. Um, now, uh, there's another way in to estimate the length of the tail, uh, or the, the size of the polar cap, let's say. Uh, and that is shown here in the, um, in this view graph here. Now, uh, Fairfield and Mead have recently published a, a, a new model a new model of the magnetosphere that's based uh, on a lot of observations. Uh, so this is a, a fitted model for a quiet magnetosphere uh, in which they uh, try to show that uh, in the equatorial plane, the field lines uh, which map down to uh, say 600 uh, at six o'clock in the morning are draped a long way back in the tail. Uh, this is looking down uh, from the North Pole in the equatorial plane of the magnetosphere, taking a cut in the equatorial plane. Uh, and in fact, they go back so far that if you make a cut in the equatorial plane at 10 Earth radii and then uh, stand up the rest of the tail like this, uh, this is what you see. And uh, the, the point then is that there's a, a lot of draping back. Uh, uh, based on the experimental measurements. And I should mention that the sort of currents necessary to maintain this 
are of the order of 10 to the seventh amps, uh, based on the curly uh, relationship, uh, curly, uh, sorry, curl B equal to J uh, from such a model. So uh, you have currents of the order of 10 to the seventh amps flowing across uh, from 6 to 16 Earth radii compared to the sort of 10 to the fifth amps that one is driving down into the magnetosphere, uh, into the ionosphere. So there's, there's much larger currents flowing out there in, in the magneto tail. And in fact, you probably need a total of about two or three times 10 to the seventh to maintain your uh, uh, neutral sheet uh, all the way out to five or 600 Earth radii. And if one does an overlay of another diagram from their paper here, uh, which attempts to map observations of solar proton and solar electron entry into the magnetosphere, they find, uh, if this model, uh, modeling fitting of the data is correct, that the uh, cross-hatched region here represents the flux of field lines that goes on down at the magneto tail. Now, uh, I would like to Okay, uh, we'll go slide off on that thing. Um, I would like to suggest that we might be able to make uh, some progress in understanding the magnetospheric configuration by looking at the, um, uh, the next slide. Um, one normally draws uh, in sketches, the electric field as going straight across uh, the uh, dawn to dusk meridian here. Uh, and if one does that, the, uh, uh, the, the polar cap is not an equipotential. The way for the polar cap to be an equipotential is to uh, maintain the tangential component of E equal to zero as it approaches the uh, polar cap boundary, which would lead to uh, curved tensions here and a concentration of all your convective flow uh, out at noon, followed by an equipotential around here and a jetting in at uh, midnight. Now, there are some observations just coming out of AE with Hansen's work that I'll report uh, in a moment. So going on to the convection diagram. This is shown here that if your electric field <laughs> is dawn to dusk straight across, then you have convection uh, that is crossing this boundary at uh, all points here. Whereas if it's uh, the polar cap is an equipotential surface mapping back uh, to the majority of the magnetopause being an equipotential surface, then uh, you'd have a concentrated electric field uh, at the nose here, and all of your convection would come forward in the oval and across at one uh, great big traffic jam uh, near the uh, place where the electric field uh, is concentrated. So uh, by getting detailed measurements of the ionospheric and the uh, optical measurements uh, at low altitudes, one might be able to determine enough about the field line patterns to gain some insight as to the potential distribution on the magnetopause. Um, now, I'd like to mention that uh, Bostrom has distinguished between two types of current systems. Your uh, currents which flow uh, in what he calls the type one, which uh, if one's going down to the earth from the equator here represents uh, flow around the oval, whereas type two represents current sheets across the oval. Now, neither of these in themselves say which is the dissipative term, but if the field pattern is uh, as it is shown, then the currents that are flowing perpendicular to the field, particularly in the dawn dusk region with this sort of pattern, uh, would have uh, an E dot J of zero, and it would be these uh, uh, current, so it should represent the Peterson current. Um, it 
It might be worth mentioning that uh, another aspect of Hepner's work uh, in respect to fields seen over the polar cap uh, is the offset uh, from uh, the uh, symmetrical case of uh, flow patterns shown here, convection flow patterns across the polar cap and returning around the uh, auroral oval to uh, either a concentration of the convection on the dawn side, which uh, is accompanied by an offset of the polar cap towards the dawn, or a concentration on the dusk side, accompanied by an offset of the polar cap towards the dusk side. And these are related to the direction of the interplanetary magnetic field Y component, azimuthal component. And uh, it has been suggested that this uh, is a, an explanation of the Svalgard uh, current uh, observations or delta B observations in the polar cap uh, with ground-based magnetometers uh, in as much as uh, what he appears to see is a current which circulates in this direction for that case uh, and uh, this may be thought of as a concentration of the Hall current which flows opposite to the convection around the dawn side a weakening of it around the dusk side and so the uh, uh, the departure from the baseline looks like a circulating current and conversely uh, in the other case it circulates in the opposite direction. So the type of magnetometer observations in the polar cap I think are a very important uh, indicator of the convection patterns as well and need additional work uh, folded into them. To, to uh, additional work on them will we'll fold in information on the electric fields. Um, now, going to another type of measurement, which is made from the AE satellite at uh, about 250 kilometers or so. This is data by Helis and Hansen of flow velocities uh, perpendicular to the uh, field lines uh, in which uh, the flow anti-sunward represents, and this is in the uh, fixed frame of the Earth. The co-rotation component has been removed. Uh, Fixed, uh, fixed frame, sorry, fixed frame of the magnetosphere, I should say. The co-rotation component uh, due to the Earth's motion has been removed. So you see, have anti-sunward flow here and sunward flow here. But more, uh, of more interest in addition is that you sometimes seem to have a very sharp flow reversal here, a shear reversal, which would represent the right-hand case uh, of the previous slide where you had the enhanced enhanced convection on the morning side here and uh, relatively little crossing over here, whereas on the <coughs> afternoon side you have uh, more crossing over here. Now that doesn't show it uh, all that well in that particular scheme. But so by finding how the plasma crosses the polar cap boundary, I think we might gain quite a bit of additional insight into the electric field configuration uh, both in the polar cap and out of the magnetopause. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a summary of some of their early results uh, from the Southern Hemisphere convection patterns and they uh, find that overall there is an offset uh, towards uh, the afternoon side here of the region of jetting out of plasma. Uh, and this uh, one point that is emphasized is that this seems to be a rather concentrated region. Uh, as opposed to crossing at a lot of points here. And so this might indicate that one has a concentration of electric field uh, at the nose. What coordinates have you got here? Sorry, uh, this is looking down on the polar cap uh, from the, uh, uh, through the Earth, I guess, from the Northern Hemisphere. So that this is 1,800 hours, uh, and that's 600 hours. 80 degrees uh, invariant or geomagnetic latitude, I'm not sure which. Uh, coordinate system they're using, but it's, it's magnetic coordinate systems. So, so this, this is dotted line or dashed line is the nominal uh, polar cap boundary and this represents the convective flow uh, around it. Um, I'm sorry to have to go rather quickly over all these different types of observations. Um, this is the 
uh, model in this case with the sun out here and dawn dusk, uh, which has been uh, calculated by Wolf uh, for the uh, distribution of electric current, uh, sorry, distribution of electric field contours that one would observe in the ionosphere uh, if you take a plasma out at a boundary point and bring it in through a model electric field and do the calculation self-consistently as I, as I understand it. But the, uh, the point here then is that these electric field contours are crossing the uh, oval at many uh, points here and uh, may not uh, correspond then to the uh, Helis and Hansen observations which seem to suggest that uh, they should run parallel to the oval most of the places and uh, come in at noon as a fairly uh, sharp uh, um, convection jetting. Uh, one thing that is shown here is the driving currents, which presumably come from the magnetospheric bow shock generator region uh, down uh, to the ionosphere and uh, represents the, the way in which uh, the current generator at a great distance uh, provides the coupling into the ionosphere. Now, if one wants to look at these current systems, uh, if they do close in the type 2 Bostrom current system, there's no way from ground... evening side where the slope of this part of the current perturbate of the magnetic field perturbation represents current flowing out of the ionosphere uh, from just ordinary uh, circuit uh, concepts and uh, this slope here represents current flowing into the uh, ionosphere and uh, the delta, delta B of about uh, 200 gamma here then represents a current intensity integrated from here to here of about 0.16 amps per meter and again from here to here since it returns to the baseline there must be the same amount flowing out. Now these are large-scale current systems it should be emphasized there are many interesting rocket measurements uh, which I won't be showing slides of today which relate to the smaller scale current systems which are associated with individual arcs and these might have considerably higher current densities than what is calculated here but very often they occur in cancelling current pairs of fairly small scale size so they don't add to the integrated large scale current pattern that one sees across the whole oval. Um, this is a KP0 plus situation so like maybe that relates to a steady state magnetosphere or maybe just to a quiet magnetosphere. Um, now uh, summarizing a lot of measurements like that, uh, as has been done with the triad uh, satellites magnetometer experiment, one finds that the current patterns uh, within the oval have uh, this characteristic. If this is looking down on the North Pole, uh, looking down on the Earth, the ionosphere, uh, and in this case, uh, this is the geomagnetic pole, uh, this is your polar cap boundary and uh, presumably uh, that's a bit of an assumption perhaps uh, and you have outward flowing currents adjacent to the polar cap boundary on the evening side inward flowing currents on the morning side uh, that's what the, the two uh, that's what the two different types of stippling represent then at lower latitudes this uh, heavy dotting indicates inward flowing current on the evening side and at lower latitudes outward flowing current on the equatorward side of the oval. Uh, B and A represent regions which in general in their earlier work appeared to be rather confused. The A may represent the harangue discontinuity in the night side, the B may re represent that jetting region which Helis and Hansen uh, find in their limited data set to be offset to about 1400 hours or it may represent something more widespread than that uh, such as the mapping down of the uh, central part of the cleft region. Um, <coughs>
Now, it would be interesting to know what currents, uh, what particle species carry these currents if one is to in, uh, understand uh, better the, uh, the coupling of the, uh, uh, of the magnetosphere to the ionosphere and perhaps the way the, one, uh, the ionosphere interacts back on the magnetosphere in the quiet situation. And uh, in this case, I've taken some ISIS data where the magnetometer, again, it's measuring the east-west component around the oval, which is the main component of the perturbation seen uh, by the tri triaxial magnetometer on the uh, uh, triad satellite. And it, it is what you'd expect from two current sheets. And uh, I've cheated a bit here by putting in a, a KP4+, plus, so it's not really a steady state magnetosphere. Uh, but what one has here is a perturbation at uh, about 1,500 hours magnetic local time on the afternoon side, uh, in which uh, the uh, latitudes around uh, 66 up to uh, 71 degrees or so represent inward flowing current because of this slope uh, here. Uh, and I should say it, it all depends which direction you, you plot the, the, the delta B whether you consider east to be positive or west to be positive. So this, this is in the opposite sense from, uh, from the exemplary slide that I showed uh, uh, too bad. So this is inward flowing current here and outward flowing current here. And the point that I want to make is that with the ISIS particle detectors on this spacecraft, one can uh, find that there is coincident with this uh, concentrated current density uh, of outward current flow near the polar cap boundary, a, a burst of 1 keV electrons, 1.3 keV, and it continues on down to uh, 100 eV electrons, and that these have sufficient uh, flux to represent the current carriers. Uh, however, this region here, uh, where there is inward flowing current, uh, does not seem to have a corresponding outward flowing flux of electrons or inward flowing flux of protons uh, within the energy ranges of the experiment. Now the, uh, the different spectrometers for particles on the spacecraft don't go below about 5 eV. So uh, one might by default suggest that this uh, current flowing into the ionosphere here is a um, carried by outward flowing uh, nearly thermal ionospheric electrons or super thermal a bit. And it should be noted that if this is current is closing across uh, the oval, it, uh, it represents a Peterson current flowing from the equatorward to the poleward boundary and therefore your electric field pattern may be deduced in its sense, uh, not exactly its vector direction, but in its sense as being poleward in that region, which corresponds to the, the Hepner and uh, um, the uh, Engine 5 observations of electric field, and, and to a growing body of data from radar observations as well, uh, ground-based incoherent scatter radar. Um, this is another slide from ISIS, and I have taken a rather quiet period here, KP of 1, 0, uh, it may not be a steady state magnetosphere, but uh, in this case, the satellite is flying from the evening side at about 60 degrees invariant latitude across the polar cap at around 84 and coming down on at noon, around uh, uh, magnetic local noon. And the uh, feature that I want to point out here is this magnetic field perturbation, delta B perturbation, due to current flow in the uh, cleft region near noon, the day side cleft. And uh, the lowest energy particle fluxes represented in this slide are about 150 electron volts. And looking at the soft particle spectrometer also on board the spacecraft, one finds that uh, below 100 eV in the 20 to 100 eV range is where the cleft fluxes are strong on that occasion, and they lie within this region here, 
This represents outward flowing current and uh, there is one spike of 150 eV electrons coincident with that, but in general uh, there's not enough flux to account for it by itself. One has to go down to lower energies. So one has a quite a concentrated current system here across about uh, four degrees of latitude, which is being uh, driven down into the ionosphere here, dissipating energy by E dot J and returning uh, here to the magnetospheric generator again, <coughs> wherever that is. And it might be mentioned that spanning that region, there is a residual flux of more energetic electrons, 20 and 40 keV electrons, which uh, one suggests may represent uh, if one took this profile, the envelope here, I should mention all this jagged stuff here is just the anisotropy of the more energetic particles uh, as observed by the spinning spacecraft and which scans in pitch angle. One has a residual flux here of this population which it suggested the turbulence, the electrostatic turbulence in the cleft region here tends to precipitate quite efficiently. Therefore, uh, you have, these are decades between lines here, an attenuation of one and a half or two decades in your intensity. But the fact that it still remains here <coughs> seems to support uh, what Pat Reef's point was that uh, there, and uh, um, Tom Hill, that there is inward diffusion onto the day side closed field lines uh, of the penetrating cleft particles. And this may not be surprising uh, if one recognizes that it is a, a electrostatically turbulent region and uh, therefore is a diffusive region. So the, the argument then is that this is part of the magnetospheric population, that the magnetospheric uh, closed field line regions come out to here. Um, maybe if we could have lights off here. Uh, this is a, an example in the early morning region uh, and uh, of field line current flow as uh, shown here by the delta B perturbation and a spectrogram from the soft particle spectrometer on the ISIS spacecraft uh, making simultaneous measurements. Uh, and this has been reported by Klumpar at the fall AGU meeting uh, last November. And uh, an attempt has been made here to identify the main features here, ignoring some of the fluctuations, uh, uh, the main features that have slopes uh, typical of that region here. And uh, one finds that if these are plasma sheet electrons going up to 10 keV, that's the, the horn of it that comes down to near the ionosphere, 10 keV down to uh, five electron volts, and the intensity of it represents, uh, the, the brightness of this white light represents the intensity, intensity modulated. One finds that associated with this region from here to here, one has a very intense structured decreasing flux of electrons, which you may see coming down here. Uh, that the higher energy electrons in this case, one to 10 keV, uh, at the low latitude edge certainly don't seem to be carrying any significant current. Uh, and on the high latitude edge in this case where you have, uh, and this is uh, outward fl flowing current on the morning side uh, near the equatorward edge and of the oval and inward flowing current near the poleward edge. This inward flowing current has quite a high density, has a steep slope. And on this occasion, one observes no outward flowing electrons associated with it down to the 5 eV threshold of the instrument. But there are other occasions when it agrees much better than that as uh, shown in, in Klumpar's paper. But the thing that I want to emphasize is that we still don't have an identification of all of the current carriers which are bringing energy in and out of the magnetosphere by their uh, uh, by their flow along the field lines. It might also be interesting to note that this, this is a structured region here which uh, may suggest that there uh, is uh, 
uh, an additional acceleration process going on, uh, perhaps what is called anomalous resistivity, parallel electric fields along the field lines, to, uh, to maintain the necessary current flow across this region, because apparently this 1 to 10 kV electron flux <coughs> by itself is not sufficient uh, to, to provide this uh, outward flow of current. If it was, why well, then you'd, you'd see it here as well. So uh, I think that the comparison of particle measurements with current flow will be fruitful in the future in trying to identify what's happening. How are we running? About five minutes. Five minutes? Yeah, okay. More or less. Um, yeah. I, I've uh, neglected to say uh, very much about the very interesting work uh, it statistically distributed uh, observations from the triad satellite uh, in which uh, a concentration of current is found around the uh, oval, uh, the polar cap boundary uh, specifically. And this is a summary of, of work from, uh, I think it's uh, Segura and, um, sorry, I don't have the reference, uh, in which one plots the percentage occurrence of uh, a, an unbalanced current system. What I've been showing you to date is, is current that appeared to perhaps close across the oval in the local time sector of observation. Whereas here, one is seeing uh, a, an occurrence of unbalanced outward flowing current uh, across these hours of magnetic local time, starting at noon and going through to 18 or 20 hundred. And a similar unbalance of uh, current into the ionosphere on the morning side. And it is a bit puzzling at this point in time uh, to find that uh, if one averaged a lot of statistics, you'd hope that current continuity would give you uh, as much uh, current outflow uh, on the afternoon as you had on uh, flowing in, in the morning if you're going to complete your circuit uh, across the polar cap, for instance. And, and this has not uh, been borne out uh, at first glance uh, uh, at this data, but uh, I think that much more work needs to be done. I'm sure that current continuity is not a, uh, uh, a thing that will be violated. And perhaps then I should just show the, uh, the observations uh, summarized by Segura of OGO5 measurements in which he models the outward flowing currents and inward flowing currents uh, that he sees as perturbations at high altitudes uh, into a current system where the lower latitude currents close in an equatorial current here, ring current, around the night side, and the high latitude ones represent driving currents that go way back in the tail. I don't think we yet know how the currents flow, and, and I think that when we do, we'll know more about where the generator is because presumably currents going to a load have to come from the generator and return to the generator. Ron, in that previous slide where you had the curves that didn't balance in the evening and in the morning, was that ISIS data or triad? No, no, that's triad data. It's a statistical summary. It's a percentage of currents that doesn't really, uh, above a given threshold, it doesn't really say uh, what the intensity is of each uh, uh, individual event. Uh, it's just uh, things may may work out when one looks at it in more detail. It's just uh, something which I think is, is, is really exciting and necessary for the future. Now here is a raw scanning photometer from uh, ISIS-1, which gives a look at the whole oval and the energy deposition as uh, you, uh, by particle excitation, uh, as you would integrate it from 3914 emission. Uh, and uh, it is very interesting. Uh, to be able to see the whole oval at once. And under these very quiet conditions of KP1 uh, plus, uh, it's plotted in uh, geomagnetic coordinates. This is the geomagnetic pole shown in each case here. This is all one pass, just with different intensities to bring out the strongest features here by turning down the gain and bring out the weakest features here by turning up the gain and progressing clockwise around it. And it's interesting that uh, you, you seem to have a little brightening just at that point uh, in, the, uh, in the oval. And the spacecraft uh, did make particle measurements flying through that, but I won't show it to you right now because I'm obviously overrunning my time. Um, 
the, when one looks again at another very quiet condition here, one sees uh, arcs around in the morning side around 700 hours as being the most predominant feature in the oval and six to 500 hours. I'm sorry about this calibration cycle that uh, interfered with viewing the oval here, but uh, that's the way Murphy's Law works. And uh, so this may represent uh, the currents necessary to come from the driving region and uh, 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 that, that are in this case more around the day side during a very quiet occasion and not much around the, uh, the night side. That's the same thing in more detail, just blown up around 500 hours there. Um, I'd like to mention two more types of observations here. Again, the same format, the faintest features here and the brightest features here. You can see where the oval is, uh, but if you look then at the fainter features, you find that there are sun-aligned arcs here and here going across the oval. And uh, the spacecraft saw these on two consecutive passes. On one occasion, it flew through the uh, center here between them, and it saw no particle fluxes uh, in the central polar cap, uh, which is shown by the next slide, and I won't belabor it. Uh, but on the next occasion, two hours later, uh, the arcs were even more prominent and had the same morphology. And uh, the spacecraft on this occasion stayed to the dusk side. And uh, the particle observations are interesting on that occasion in that across the polar cap, one sees uh, a substantial flux of 150 eV and 1.3 keV electrons, like a rather uh, cool plasma sheet or warm magneto sheath type plasma. And so what I'd like to suggest is that perhaps on this occasion, the, uh, the polar cap is delimited to something as small as these most forward, most continuous arcs. And that this region from here down to the main region of the oval is a tenuous extended tail uh, of field lines, uh, which nevertheless contains uh, slightly warmed over magneto sheath plasma. And this is your main inner magneto uh, tail, your, uh, your inner plasma sheet mapping down. So this is some of the problems of energy input, the currents driving them, the electric fields, and I hope that ionospheric measurements, particularly radar backscatter and so on, which I haven't mentioned, uh, the ground-based measurements as well, uh, done by ionospheric physicists will help out the magnetospheric physicists to understand what the deuce is going on a long way out in the tail and in the magneto sheath. Time is running on, uh, and I, no, no. <laughs> the, the intent of that was to try to organize uh, the subsequent discussion between now and, and lunchtime. Uh, perhaps we should entertain direct comments or questions concerning <coughs> this talk, and then uh, go on into the question of field-aligned currents. I've had three separate people ask to present one or two slides, and that way will take uh, Ron off the hook for being responsible for everything that's said about field-aligned currents let him sit down and rest a bit, and we, then we can progress on. So do we have comments or questions that it would pertain directly to the, uh, the talk we've just heard? Well, I must have really put down a lot of information at that point. <laughs> I'm sorry, there's a question in the back. If we need you, Ron, we will call you back up to the podium. You've already seen a couple of slides of the uh, AEC data and our flow patterns that we think are in the, uh, in the um, polar cap. Uh, I should point out that the displacement of that uh, small region through which the, the plasma then expands over the polar cap was displaced over to the afternoon side. And that displacement depends on the direction of the interplanetary magnetic field, just as this as the strength of the electric field that uh, Kinnett and people saw depend on the interplanetary field. So that region moves over to the morning side if the, if the interplanetary field would become dust to dawn instead of dawn to dusk. The other comment concerns this uh, slide here. 
Um, the slides that uh, Ron Burris showed were cuts across uh, almost parallel to the dawn dusk plane, and then we see clearly defined reversals. One of the requirements which Pat and Tom need is some sort of uh, electrostatic turbulent field in the region where they have the uh, uh, diffusion of particles, and we do have passes that go through the region uh, where all this thing happens, and you can see, uh, well, uh, the slide sort of speaks for itself. It surely is turbulent, and uh, well, we really don't know what's going on there, and it, it could be that, that the small region uh, where the plasma expands across the polar cap is, is maybe this merging thing, and then way out in the flanks or wherever it goes when it gets to the magnetopause, uh, you see uh, the signature in the ionosphere looks like this like that for these regions. And we're starting to look at more data like this, but this just gives you an example of what you see if you actually go fly through the auroral oval, if you like, or through the auroral region where things are not quite so well defined. So. <coughs> Is that a comment? <coughs> you need me here, Steve? Yes. Oh, we'll see. <laughs> um, what I understand you're saying is this could be, or what Ron's comment comments were on were a steady state magnetosphere. Right. Is this steady state? This is uh, well. You can <laughs> you can see the date on there. Okay, it's, it's 75, and uh, the information you need to require to decide whether it's steady state is not readily available. You really have to go beat on people, uh, and and they beat on somebody else. It's really hard to get magnetograms and things like this. As far as we can tell, that is steady state. I can show you some that isn't steady state, and it's even worse. <laughs> okay, uh, what I, I look at this and I say, okay, that's a very turbulent region. The magnetic field has to be quite mixed up when it gets down in the tail. Right. And yet, uh, I recall a series of uh, Cliff Anger's uh, ISIS-1 um, work in, I think it was a December 71 storm, which shows very nice patterns right, you know, essentially in the uh, 0600 uh, local time region, which for three orbits during a storm uh, give almost the same pattern superimposed on that, indicating that things are rather stationary, or at least the magnetic field configuration would be somewhat stationary. And some old Engine 3 work that I did uh, looking at uh, some particle precipitation, again, indicated that things were very stationary over periods of you know, six hours or more. And this seems to be quite contradictory, how you can have such turbulence and yet such time stationary features in the auroral pictures in the particle flux. Yeah, well, we, we don't know what the, what the magnetic field is doing in the situation. We don't have any magnetometers on board or anything like that, so we can't, we can't really tell, uh, you know, what, what the magnetic field is. We can use a magnetic field model and, and calculate the E field. It's, it, it's difficult to, to decide exactly what's, uh, you know, what, what is causing the, the velocity signature we see there, whether that is uh, variations in B or electric field or, or what. Well, my, my, my point was that the work that Cliff did and some of the old Engine 3 stuff that I did, it was definitely disturbed. I mean, you, you were in a big, big magnetic storm, and yet things were very ordered. And I hear you saying this is steady state and it's very turbulent. Well, so. maybe if we look at the disturbed data, it'll turn out to be ordered. No. <laughs> of course, there's always the possibility that in the quiet state, you have very, very irregular electron precipitation, and the electric fields themselves then become very irregular, irregular, whereas in the disturbed case, you have very much more well-defined precipitation patterns, and the electric field uh, then looks much more, more uniform. Uh, I, with re this regard, uh, where were the precipitation boundaries, do you recall, uh, in this particular case? I, I don't recall, to be honest. I, I wouldn't like to say where they, where they might be either. I, I don't remember exactly where they were. And I must admit, it doesn't look all of that uh, quiet. If you look at the lower right-hand corner, uh, you see down to a latitude 50 degrees significant uh, plasma drift, which uh, certainly, I don't know, is it us usual or unusual? Yeah, well, I think that the, uh, whatever co-rotation has been taken out of these measurements as well, and whatever it is that... Uh, uh, alphane currents that shield the uh, plasma pores from the magnetospheric field or whatever it is, that 55 degrees invariant is a, is a, is a better boundary than 60 degrees invariant for, uh, for quiet times. And 
I just like to caution that one should probably be quite careful in calling this turbulence because the kind of scales you can resolve here are not at all of the order of magnitude that the speakers this morning would need. Yeah, right, I agree. <coughs> well, in answer to uh, Princess uh, comments, I think I should have pointed out that it is uh, quite possible to have a stationary pattern of, of, a, of a turbulent uh, a turbulent region. So there are many examples in all kinds of systems. You have an airplane wing, there is a, 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 a turbulent wake, uh, which is quite stationary, well defined in a, in a if you look, if you look at it from the plane. So I don't see any obvious contradiction in having a, a turbulent flow in one region uh, which persists uh, for, for long periods of time. Are there any uh, further direct comments concerning electric fields? If uh, did you wish to? Uh, well, why don't you wait just a second? Because I was going. If, if we're going to switch into field aligned currents vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, electric fields, I, I have a, a little set pattern, and I'll fit you into it. Rich, uh, are there other comments concerning plasma convective motion, uh, ionospheric or other? That, uh, uh, Bob. Seems to be one of the critical problems in this whole area is how the interplanetary electric field uh, patterns, uh, interplanetary electric field provide the patterns we've seen here at low altitudes. Uh, I think Ron alluded to it a little bit with Stern's model. Is there any other work being done now in this problem, or is it something that the, this uh, body is generally ignoring? All those saying aye, please stand up. <laughs> Well, it looks like uh, no one's willing to admit that they're doing work in that particular area. <laughs> oh, there, that latecomer, one. <laughs> so, yes, Bill? I'd like to make one comment that the picture that I think Ron Rural showed that showed that the, the large flux coming in on the, on the afternoon side, or I forgot whether that was North Pole or South Pole, but for those of you that aren't familiar with the data of Hepner and so forth, if you look at the opposite hemisphere, it's on the evening side in the north, I mean on the northern pole, it's on the morning side in the south pole. They are asymmetric, and that seems to be a general pattern. But, uh, I suppose at some point someone should make a comment about concerning the conjugacy of electric fields, uh, and you're about the only person around that can do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to make a couple of comments. First, the uh, quality of the first slide <laughs> prompts me to say that you can get good copies of this figure from me. However, I think I will update it to uh, show the uh, more recent results, the, uh, <coughs> the um, plasma mantle and also the entry layer. And in fact, uh, in this updating, if there's any information which you think should go on such a new uh, drawing, please send it to me. In the next few weeks, I will come up with a new drawing now send it to all, everybody who came to the conference here. Uh, second point about the, uh, the dayside electric field, the, the Hansen Helis uh, data suggests this uh, very narrow uh, region across the dayside where the electric field is rather strong. If that is in fact the electric field which is supposedly due to reconnection, uh, it would map out the fairly small region of the dayside uh, magnetopause. This would mean that the Chapman Frero or the dayside magnetopause current would do work, would dissipate energy. In this case, then the energy dissipation would be over a smaller region, fairly small region, uh, smaller than what I had assumed in the letter I published last April. I assumed a very large region in order to get very small energy per particle would, that would be carried away in order to conserve total energy. In this case, the total number of particles interacting with this region would be smaller so that the energization per particle in the steady state would be larger. It should be very easy to observe this somewhere in the plasma mantle or boundary layer regions. Hi, Ron. Will it respond directly? A comment on your first comment. Uh, maybe it's a good thing it was fuzzy because this, I think, does represent the degree of our understanding uh, that we put into a model at this point, with, with no uh, reflection on Walter as an individual, because he's the only person who's tried to draw a three-dimensional model. Uh, sorry, no, there have been two people, Walter and uh, uh, Lou Frank. Uh, 
<coughs> and, uh, and the second thing uh, I want to say is in respect to Walter's second comment, and that is that uh, I think that we really do have to include the whole magnetosheath out to the bow shock in trying to understand it, because it's only once you get beyond the bow shock that the solar wind, plasma, and magnetic field is relatively uninformed about the uh, obstacle that it's approaching. And if that's the case, uh, it is possible that if the generator region is uh, out in the bow shock, that is, that is where some energy is being extracted from the plasma, partly as it's changed from flow energy into thermal energy, it, it, there is some net extraction of energy, then the plasma which arrives at the magnetosphere, at the magnetopause, may be uh, deficient in energy in that boundary layer, and the chapman frauer current may, as the load part of the circuit, return that energy to it. And uh, now, uh, maybe I should wave both hands, because I don't know what measurements uh, support this or refute it. And I'm not sure that the measurements are systematic enough in the magnetosheath yet to say one way or the other. And I appreciate some comment. Uh, Irwin has the mic on that side. Peter tossed out some bait this morning, but no, nobody else would rise, so fools always step in where angels fear to tread. Let me go back to the question of what is meant by disturbed and quiet. I remember some years ago, Walter Becker looked through 10 years of KP records, and he found a few days with the very lowest available values. And on three of those days, he found a period where the whole ionosphere was lifted up by nearly 100 kilometers and plonked down again. So this opened the question of what is meant by quiet and disturbed. And I think uh, Vasilyan has just said it there. Let me rephrase it, if I may. Uh, if you imagine the magnetosphere is like a bathtub, there is one phase where the tap's turned on and the tub fills. And it may be, as we heard Pat describe this morning, that you need some turbulence in order to get the particles in. And then somebody pulls out the bung and the bathtub empties. Now, which are you going to call the quiet and which are you going to call the disturbed condition? Is the disturbed condition when the bathtub empties? Is the disturbed condition just that short period where the plug is pulled and the substorm is triggered? Or are you distinguishing between some time when the tap is turned on with rather more force and you get the thing filling more rapidly, uh, or where the hole is a little bigger and it empties more rapidly? Uh, what do you mean by quiet and disturbed? And can you order the situation a little bit better in terms of the phase where the particles are entering and the magnetosphere is filled or inflated or whatever word you want to use, and the phase where it's dumped and emptied into the substorm? <coughs> These hydraulic analogies can give one a sinking feeling, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I would point out that the questions are not to me, but to the audience as a whole. Uh, although, in order to have posterity and not posterior, you do have to face the, the camera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there a response? Ron, do you want to make a response to uh, that? Very briefly, I think that in the real magnetosphere, this question is very important. It's probably not relevant to the steady state magnetosphere accession that we're considering here, because we consider that in that case, the bathtub has a certain amount of water in it, and that's that. It's neither emptying nor filling. But uh, it would be nice to study the real magnetosphere, I agree. I'm certain that the uh, ring current has a uh, particular piece <laughs> 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 Which way around is it going? We are running short of time, and I would like to uh, have time for several people to make uh, brief presentations. Uh, I'd like to call, I believe, first of all, Rolf uh, Bostrom wanted to show a slide and discuss uh, the double pairs of parallel currents. Is that you're going to use the view graph. I'll bring it over to you if you want to come over on the side. I'll you up. No, I would like to make a comment uh, regarding the double current structure that the Birkeland current sheets have been observed to have. And as we saw on a slide that Ron Barris showed, uh, it is in the morning hours only about 10% of the cases that the double current sheets do not balance. So what we really should worry about is models where 
the two current sheets are of the same intensity. And I would like to discuss a way to close the current sheets and generate this double current structure. We know from the observations that the polarity of the current sheets is as shown in this figure, which only is meant to be schematic. We know that the electric fields in the auroral oval are northward in the evening, southward in the morning. And if we map these electric fields out into the magnetosphere, we will find that the electric field directions are like this and like that. That is, the electric fields will be oppositely directed to the current flow here. We have the conditions that we should have in a dynamo region. How could a dynamo operate here? Well, if we look on the plasma flow that is associated with this electric field, the plasma velocity would be like this and like that. And if we look on the direction of the J cross B magnetic force, J perpendicular cross B, we find that this force is directed oppositely to the plasma flow direction. J cross B would be this way. So the J cross B force would break the plasma motion and energy would be taken out of this convective plasma flow to drive this current system. This is a very old model, nothing new. The problem with this model has been that there doesn't seem to be enough kinetic energy available in this convective plasma flow if we work with a model with dipolar field lines like this figure shows. However, we know now that the auroral oval maps out into the tail plasma sheet, and as we heard, this extends way back in the magnetosphere for hundreds of Australia, perhaps. So there is a lot of plasma available, in fact, in between these two current sheets if we modify this model. And there seems to be enough kinetic energy available in this plasma motion to drive these current systems. Gordon Rostocker and I myself have constructed a model with a modified geometry. It will appear in print soon, so I will not comment further on it. I would last, just like to make another remark that with this current closure, according to alternative one in this figure, the morning and evening sectors of the current systems are decoupled. We could have different intensity in the current flow, but if we use the model advocated by Sugiura and others with a partial ring current connecting the morning and evening current systems, they must at all times balance. We don't know from available data whether such a balance exists at all times or not, but these current sheets would be the driving agents for the whole current electrojets. And if we have a coupling according to model two, these electrojets would presumably balance at all times, or at least we would expect to see synchronous temporal variations in the electrojets. This is a test that could be applied to the model, and at least for disturbed conditions, we know that the westward electrojet is much stronger than the eastward electrojet, so this coupling seems to break down during disturbed conditions, at least. Well, thank you. I'll just stay for a minute. Are there direct comments that people would like to make on this uh, or these ideas? Yes, in the rear. Thank you. I have a question, Rolf. Uh, how confident are you and the others that those currents close <coughs> near the equator? An obvious alternative would be, of course, that they close down in the other, in the opposite hemisphere. If they close in the opposite hemisphere, uh, one of the hemispheres would be the generator, the other the lobe, and we would have an opposite polarity. If we look on the polarity of the current flow, we see that both ionospheres are lobes. The generator must be out of the magnetosphere. Of course, it's not only in the equatorial plane, but this current should be distributed in between the current sheets. 
I have another question, if I may. Uh, the existence of these field line currents will produce a transverse field perturbation, which will, which will cause the, the uh, magnetic fields to bend out of the uh, meridian planes. I would have thought that that perturbation would have been significant enough that in making these drawings, one would normally have drawn those field lines as being bent, perhaps being convected around, rather than uh, in indicating as though they were dipole field lines. Would you comment on that? Yes, uh, this is just meant to be a schematic view. The field lines are certainly bent by the field line currents, and especially they are drawn out into the magnetotail, so the geometry would be different. And this bending of the field lines by the field line currents, in fact, agrees with a, the skew of the tail magnetic field that has been observed. The polarity of the current flow gives the right skew angle. Carl McElwain. Yes, I just want to make a, a general type comment, is that you, you have uh, drawn on this figure parallel currents, radially outward currents, and a uh, westward current. In other words, all three possible components. And presumably, there's nothing in the physics that demand that they have to be only one in one, each region of space. In other words, you're presumably admitting the possibility here of a current at an arbitrary direction relative to the magnetic field. Is that correct? In other words, you can admit any mixture of these. Uh, you mean in the magnetosphere? Yes, on these same field lines here. I've drawn two alternatives, one alternative, two. Uh, but uh, is there some physics that say you cannot mix these cases? No, but there would be different physics associated with the two cases. This one could be driven yes, by that, inertial forces. That's part forces. of my point. Uh, is, uh, that are we possibly being a little bit naive in demanding only one of the components at each point in space? Our thinking changes very radically now. If you I admit the possibility of the current having an arbitrary direction relative to the magnetic field. You can think in very different types of closures now if you just mix your cases. Well, I just want to make the point that we can have a closure like this driven by inertial forces. Yes. We can have another kind of closure, but that would lead to coupling between the morning and evening yes. sectors. Which uh, I was really trying to make a very simple point. If you mix your cases here, then you can end up with very complex current patterns. Sure. Isn't, isn't that right? And there's nothing in the physics that we know so far to, to deny the possibility. No. But it changes, you, as you say, our, our concepts and the types of, of, of the physics. And, and on the same line, I would like to say I, uh, we, we must admit that also with respect to the electric fields. We tend to think in terms of perpendicular electric fields at one moment, and the next moment think in terms of parallel electric fields. But I claim there's nothing in the physics to say that it can't be occurring concurrently at the same point in space. And therefore, we must think in terms of, in general, of oblique electric fields. Well, I make comments basically on the same lines. And the, I think it's a little bit dangerous to sort of make very, very clear tests on the basis of balance or, or lack of it. Uh, so there might be appropriate in an ideal geometry where uh, you had only this particular current system present. Uh, but in the real case, with a more complicated geometry, even these two simple alternatives will not give you such a clean uh, current. In addition, I think there's little question there are additional current systems present, the driving currents from dawn to dusk and, and so on. And uh, so even if there is or is not, say, a bad balance in this particular aspect of the currents, one will not expect a balance in the actual total observed current, which is all that one can see from ground records. All right. Did you have a response? Keith? Um, Concerning the, uh, the magnetic uh, effect at the surface of the Earth from these currents, uh, would you get a negative bay from this equatorial current at low latitudes at the same time as you've got a negative bay in the polar regions from your Hall current? If so, is that in accordance with observation or, or not? Well, this figure refers, and the mechanism refers more to the quiet time conditions and the signature at low latitude would be rather weak magnetic disturbance. It would be 
of the same polarity as in the auroral zone, since the auroral currents would dominate over the contribution from the equatorward current. Yeah, but that, that is the opposite of what happens in the case of a magnetic bay. Right? Yes, but a magnetic bay and a substorm is something quite different from uh, the steady state convection electrodes. And there's one point I should have made here, which I forgot to mention. As I see it, there is no need to connect these current systems out into the primary dynamo, which must be in the solar wind. Energy may well be transferred from the primary dynamo in the solar wind to within the magnetosphere in form of convective plasma flow. I think uh, one more uh, presentation. Uh, Dave uh, Klumpar was uh, going to make a short presentation. I'm sorry to cut off discussion slightly here. Perhaps it's better to use uh, these presentations as the focus of the, the discussion. I'd like to use my allocation of two slides to show a couple more examples of um, simultaneous uh, field line current and, and uh, magnetometer, uh, field line current from the magnetometer uh, and uh, simultaneous uh, particle observations from the ISIS satellite. And I'll, I'll show just two examples, first slide. And can we have all of the lights out? <coughs> this, is, uh, this is a case on the post-midnight uh, sector at about, about 0100 hours. The satellite is, is proceeding equatorward, 78 degrees in variant latitude, uh, down to 60, uh, 65 <coughs> degrees at this point. Um, what I want to try to point out here is the, is the market correspondence between changes in, in, uh, in uh, the uh, character of the precipitating, of, of not only precipitating, but also upgoing um, electrons between the 5 EV and 15 kilovolt, and changes in the uh, um, current density uh, associated with uh, these delta Bs. Um, for example, let's start from this side. This is the equatorward edge. Uh, I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but essentially simultaneously with the simultaneous or coincident with the, uh, the equatorward boundary of the plasma sheet type uh, isotropic kilovolt electrons uh, is the uh, end of the current, current sheet. Uh, that region continues basically to this point where the uh, current <coughs> density uh, undergoes a marked uh, change in, in intensity. Uh, at the same time that the particle flux undergoes a, a strong uh, change in pitch angle distribution and, uh, and energy distribution becoming more field aligned uh, over these two or three spins of the satellite. Incidentally, this is a pitch angle down here. It's a spinning satellite. Uh, and also tending towards some monoenergetic peaks uh, at a few kilovolts. Then the current changes sign. We get very strong fluxes of uh, very um, um, spatially uh, um, small or spatially or temporally rapidly varying fluxes of very low energy electrons. Many of these are electrons coming directly up the, up the field line from below the satellite at 1400 kilometers, uh, carrying a very strong um, downward current throughout, throughout this region. And then uh, we pass into again another region where there's essentially very little fluxes. We, don't, we see f uh, essentially no upward current, and yet the magnetometer still indicates an upward current. Um, let's go to the next example, which is, which is pre-midnight, about 20 hundred hours. Next slide. Uh, in this case, high latitude is here. We're over the polar cap. We're going towards lower latitude. Uh, the current sheet begins essentially at about at essentially uh, 69 degrees. Uh, several orders of magnitude enhancement in the total number of flux of 5 EV to 15 kilovolt electrons, about three orders of magnitude, at the same time that the uh, upward current region is, uh, is indicated in the magnetometer. Then a precipitous drop again, change in the um, electron fluxes uh, coincident with the, with the uh, um, opposite directive current sheet towards the equatorward edge. Uh, in this case, there's, there's some fluctuation here. Another uh, a smaller set of uh, current sheets, and some very interesting, very low energy, uh, less than 
uh, oh, about uh, less, certainly less than 100 EV, uh, very spiked uh, electrons mm -hmm. in that case. Um, I think that's it for the slides. In general, uh, we see, in general, we, we can't account, f we, we can't always account for the, um, for the downward current region. Uh, for example, here, there just, there just isn't enough particle uh, current being carried by uh, 5 EV to 15 kilovolt particles uh, to account for this very, very steep drop, uh, or this very steep gradient, which corresponds to a downward current sheet. Uh, in here, there, there's a very strong uh, flux of precipitating electrons giving uh, more than enough current to account for the uh, outward current flow. Hey, what's the local time in Grand Latitude? Uh, the local time in this one was, was 19 hours. In Grand Latitude, 69, down to 63, <coughs> down to about 60. Uh, in, oh, and, and at the same time, we have simultaneous, um, of course, the positive ion measurements over the same, same energy range. And uh, they're essentially carrying negligible current, uh, factor of 10 or, or 100 below what's being carried by the electrons. That's a general. general right? uh, it's interesting that you mentioned the protons. Uh, we've, we've seen some interesting cases similar to that. Of course, on AE, we don't have the magnetic field, which is a tragedy. It's much clearer when you can do it that way. But. Um, we see electron accelerations. That you look at the distribution function, and the electron spectrum clearly shows a, uh, an acceleration. And we can see, as this acceleration changes, we can see the proton distribution changing uh, simultaneously and in the opposite direction to be a, a field-aligned potential drop. In fact, one time we saw this variation go so far as to show the protons having a net acceleration. In other words, the first observation that I know of, of, of seeing the protons actually carrying some current. And it turned out that this, the proton acceleration was on the uh, equatorward side. Mm, no comment. No comment for the record. Right. Further questions? John? Did you, did you have a question? We're at a point now where I think we're obliged to, to terminate this morning session. But before we do that, I think, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Can I show a couple slides? <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, I guess I'd better find Joe, because we have a fairly tight schedule. And uh, I'll have to ask him. We're at the closing point now. Should we can carry on? Are they going to die in the kitchen? Well, we'll carry on for a few more minutes at least because people do like to have a chance to get cleaned up before lunch. And so who is going to make a, there are two people that want to make brief presentations. John Foster will make the first. And then uh, Rich Von Drack will make the second. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I'd like to carry on with the experimental observations of these field-aligned currents and the, the convection patterns that they relate to and in keeping with the topic of this conference, the effects on some ionospheric parameters associated with them. What I've shown here are our data from three separate experiments with the ISIS-2 satellite. The top curve shows the delta B measurements, the magnetometer perturbations due presumably to field line current flow. And in this orientation of the satellite spin axis, a positive deviation cor corresponds to that region in which there is sunward con con convection. These satellite passes go from the dawn side to the dusk side, just poleward of the day side cleft region. In this case, in invariant latitude, reaching a maximum latitude of around 83 degrees. Now, what I'd like to show you here, other than, well, these bottom four, four curves show you the energetic particle de de detector data on this pass, which shows you electron data in the energy range of 150 eV through 1 6 keV and greater than 40 keV particles. The second curve down shows you the electron density. These are thermal electrons measured at the satellite altitude, 1,400 kilometers. And for this data that I'm going to show you, these two slides, the 10 to the third density level is approximately a baseline. What I'd like to tell you here 
is that the cleft particles seen with the soft particle spec spectrometer instrument are in this region and in this region on this pass. And the electron temperatures in the ionosphere, which are not shown, are warm in this region, cold in this region, and warm in this region. What the temperatures mean, when you have a density above the base level and a warm temperature, you are presumably in a production region in the ionosphere. The soft particles that are precipitating in the cleft region are actually giving you the, the, the enhancement of ionospheric density. In this region, just poleward of the cleft, on the, on the day side, you are seeing cool, dense ionospheric plasma that, in this sort of an interpretation, would be, could be thought of as convecting anti-sunward from the cleft region. This is in, even though it's a very low K, KP time, this particular pass is in the recovery phase of a magnetic storm. And the convection pattern anti-sunward from the cleft is fairly uniform back from the day side. If I could have the second slide, which is in very quiet times, which may be more in keeping with the, with the steady state uh, characteristic of this morning session. Uh, I'll show you the same data set for, for very quiet times. The negative deviations in delta B correspond to regions of anti-sunward con convection. In very quiet times, near the day side of the magnetosphere, field line currents that delineate a region of sunward flow are not seen. So those field line currents are very low. The only thing you're seeing left is an, instant, an instance of anti-sunward flow. And in this case, those are coincident with cleft-like particles seen with the SPS instrument. Now, electron temperatures are warm, coincident with the cleft particles and the high density. Cool in this region, which is over on the afternoon side and could be a region of anti-sunward con convecting plasma. But what I really want to point out to you today is in the center of the region, this is directly poleward of noon in quiet time, the electron densities in the ionosphere are quite low. And what this says is that the convection anti-sunward from the cleft during quiet times appears to flow around the edges of the polar cap and not straight back across it. Even when you, when you, when you are quite close to the to the cleft position, you still do not see the effects of precipitation in the, in the cleft immediately poleward of, of noon. Now, other passes during this time period show the, the enhanced ionospheric density extending back from the cleft around the, the poleward edges of the polar cap as kind of a, a halo of, of density. And this I would suggest as a quiet time pattern of convection. And I, I have some other data that shows passes on the night side of the invariant pole in quiet and disturbed times, but I won't show those now. That's all. Colin, which uh, fund track next for a short presentation? Uh, I just want to make a comment about the morphology of the field line currents on the uh, pre-midnight sector. And this is uh, based on some, a study done by Roland Tsunoda and Tom Patemra, where they've taken auroral clutter maps made by the SRI Homer.